building, uh, the Monk Holiday, the, the other, uh, the, 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 the Ken Burns documentary that was recently featured. Uh, um, so it sort of brought a sense of hope to the Southeast Asian, not just the Cambodian community. Um, so when that passed, we took that to Washington, D.C. Because I knew that it was very difficult for men of um, Chad's age to be able to go knock down, uh, knock doors of Caden Hall and some of the other the senators' doors to, to really to communicate. And, and my background is in business development. Uh, I, uh, I branding and communication and business development, that's what I do good at. But this community seems to lack that. Branding and communication and getting, expressing what we need, what we want, and uh, uh, some of our struggle to the mainstream community. So that's where my role uh, came in. I stepped into this organization that was founded almost 10 years before I came in, uh, uh, five years legally and 10 years uh, uh, in informally. Um, when that passed in Washington, D.C. in 2014, keep in mind that prior to 2014, America did not recognize that the Hmong people, the Cambodian people, the South Vietnamese and Southeast Asians had any role in fighting alongside America. Mm -hmm. they, they, uh, they were books, and in the, in the other room, you'll see that there are uh, dozens of books that have been written about the secret war, and there's a reason why it's called a secret war, because they don't want people to know about it. Yeah. Yeah. And so when, so when the community that lacks the English skill to educate and to communicate, so then the secret becomes a reality, it becomes a secret. No one knows about it, 30, 40, 50 years. So we decided to, to maybe do, do the reverse. Uh, when we got, we, we, we mobilized 200 and some men from around the country to go to Washington, D.C., and we slept in a Buddhist temple for about a week, and we, uh, we, we formed groups to knock on the doors of the congressmen and women and the senators, and basically asking them to, not for remuneration or any kind of benefits, basically uh, a, a resolution is simply, it's like a greeting card that validates, that solidifies a relationship between these young fellows and the values that we fight for in America today, which is the freedom, freedom and democracy that we have today. So that was passed uh, in the U U.S. Senate, and we came back to Minnesota, and, and at that time I thought, you know, let's just not recognize the four years and uh, six months and five days of torture and genocide and, and the killing, because we, because uh, up until that time, I, you, you know, I came here in 19, uh, 1981 myself, and throughout my entire life, I did not know anything about what he went through. I did not know much about the arts, the culture, the heritage, the contributions. Uh, what I knew was that I was a genocide survivor. And I came to America and, and we have a new life. And, uh, and I think at that, around 2015, I sort of thought, I sort of made this assumption that that's probably why a lot of Asian Americans and Cambodian Americans are sort of a been repelled from, 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 from community services because they, they don't know why they should be doing it. <laughs> until they have, until they're compelled, until they have a, until they're touched in some way, there's no reason why someone that is 12 or 15 or 18 years of age would want to volunteer to help their community because they don't feel it's important enough to volunteer. So we wanted to create a platform where young people can feel important to be part of America, but but also to be uh, feel important to have their their identity, which is what these guys wanted to do was really to, to to transfer to transfer some common values to the young people, and the only way to do that was to not focus so much on the the, the genocide that killed whatever that number is 1.5 to 3 million people, and convert that into a platform that promotes positive contributions of a people that also while at the same time preserving the evidence of their, of their identity. Uh, uh, if you look around this museum, that's what you have here. And the organization is called the Eye Care, and the museum just happens to be our biggest project. It just happens to be what people know us for. But the Eye Care was born out of the, uh, the idea that to reverse the genocide, you have to get people who care, individuals who care. So individuals like uh, uh, Om Cha here, he was a, he's, he's a veteran, 
if he didn't care to volunteer his time, and if 250 other men didn't care to volunteer their time to lobby and, uh, in the U.S. Senate, and the U.S. Congress, and the House and Senate here in, in Minnesota, then this would not happen. This would not have happened. It would have just still be something, uh, a secret war that's hidden inside of a book somewhere out there. So, so we decided to call the organization I Care because uh, whether it's veterans, or whether it's an artist, whether it's a martial artist, whether it's uh, performing arts, whether it's a man that came here and spent six months to draw, uh, to draw this uh, 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 inch by three, inch for us. Three months. Uh, it took three months, I'm sorry, that came and, and, and draw this. It's part of our eye care organization because the genocide was designed to kill people. It's designed to end a people. It, it, it's designed to end values, end culture, end language. So in order for us to reverse the genocide, we have to create, bring to life what they try to end. And that's what we're trying to do here, is trying to bring back to life what we have here. And, and, and it, um, we've sort of compressed 2,500 years of history into what you see here. But uh, as I was, uh, I, uh, I had a conversation with John, and John asked me some very, some very, um, for someone that confessed that he didn't know a whole lot about what's in here, he sure asked the kind of questions that <laughs> Many Cambodians will not have an answer for. Mm -hmm. So wow. luckily, we met today, and and and, 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 and some of the questions we asked was, well, what, what you know, what um, what makes Cambodia, uh, what what makes it different, uh, what makes the Cambodian egg roll different, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I, 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 or, and then he had asked about what what makes the martial art, the Khmer, the Cambodian martial art, different, unique. He said, well, those are the type of questions that that. It's, it's coming from someone that has content and context about individual values, uh, uh, values of different culture. And I said, well, it's like the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire broke apart, you have French, you have, uh, you have the French, you have the Italian, you have the Portuguese, you have the Germans, you have the Swedes, you have the, uh, the, the, the Turkey, the Turks, and so on and so on. These groups don't get along today, even today. Yeah. So when the Roman Empire broke apart, you have, you have certain values that still carry, that are still shared throughout Europe, but you still have certain values that are not, uh, values that are distinct, meaning that you, you don't call someone that is German a French, and you don't call someone that is an Italian a German, you would get into some friction. And the same thing in Cambodia today. The founding of, uh, of the Khmer people started somewhere around the third and fourth century. And before there was Thailand, before there was uh, Vietnam, much of Vietnam today, before there was Burma, uh, the Red people Burma, which, uh, before there were much of the countries of Southeast Asia today, you had the, the Khmer Empire, which was sort of like the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. okay. And that, so when that empire broke apart, you had what you have today. You have the maybe two dozen of a different type of ethnicity. Uh, the Laotians, the Khmer, the Vietnamese, the, uh, the Karen, the Burmese. So very similar to how the, when the Roman broke apart, the Khmer Empire broke apart and you have all these different countries. So about two months ago, you know, prior to my return from Cambodia, I, knew, I, I was very foreign to the Khmer culture myself. Because my, my, my background is in, is in uh, taking something and creating mass appeal. For example, I just launched the first smart mobile, uh, smartphone real estate company last week in the United States. And so that's what I do. I take something that is that is very ambiguous, something that is confusing, and I, make, I simplify it. So I thought I'd do the same thing for this community on a volunteer basis. Because it's a community that lacks communication skills. So we simply take something, a complicated topic, that, that unless we communicate it in, in the right kind of tone, it gets people into a, a very, uh, uh, very uh, a situation where it's very full of tension, a lot of stress, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, maybe bickering, a lot of uh, history-driven emotions. Um, I ran the a CIA agent, former CIA agent came here 
and he introduced himself. And I said, you know what? Um, I don't know either. <laughs> and that really gave me, it's sort of a, it's kind of like the, the, the Lord uh, setting the light, shedding light on the So these texts tell, and said, well, I know why you, you're confused, because all those people there came from the same origin, right? That's why you're confused. I said, and it makes sense. It, it's like saying, why does why do the Germans use Latin characters? Why do the French use the same ABCs and call it A B C, and then the the, the the English uses the same ABC and call it ABC, and Americans call it A? Well, because we have we have to use we have to follow we each, uh, the people were founded from the same origin. So when that CIA former CIA officer came, he said, "Well, can I donate?" It? to the museum, I said, I, I would like you to be part of our history when I when I present this to groups of people because the people, they came from the same origin. And that's why you have confusion. That's why you have people that, that, that um, uh, instead of taking some uh, our differences and try to create um, tension, we want to take our differences and educate the American public and educate our community as to why we should be closer, why we should work together, why we should come together. And and that's and, and this is a real life example of why this community, uh, this, this this whole museum was formed because the founding of the client empire stemmed out of this idea of building a heaven on earth, which is very unique. Uh, why I had asked John John said, well, what makes it what makes the Cambodian people unique? Well, the Cambodian people were very ambitious people who wanted to build a heaven on earth. And that's not a figure of speech, they did. They built thousands of temples throughout Southeast Asia. So if you were, to, uh, if you travel from Indonesia to Thailand, to Vietnam, to, to, to Burma, what you'll see is you'll see thousands of temples that have very similar inscriptions and writings in. Well, that means that it's evidence that they all came from the same uh, root. And that's what we, if you look around the museum, you'll see the, the peacock dancers over there, which we bring to life at the Festival of Nations and other cultural events at schools and universities and community events. You have the Hanuman there. Uh, John asked me, well, I hear about Hanuman uh, in, in India, there's Hanuman in Cambodia, there's Hanuman, so what's going on? Well, guess what? The prince from India came, sailed his boat up the May, down the Mekong and came to Cambodia and married a my princess, <laughs> and they're born Cambodian today, as the Khmer people. So that's where Hanuman was transferred to modern day Cambodia, very similar to uh, how did America come to speak English? Well, the English came here, right? That's where how that's how we came here to the Plymouth Rocks and so on and so on. And so very similar. This this this, uh, this uh, connectivity there between the India. And Cambodia, and the other thing that I said, John had brought up, I said, John, did you know that the oldest known number zero is in Cambodia? And John says, Oh, I did not know that. <laughs> said, the oldest number, the oldest known number zero is founded in Cambodia, and three years later in Indonesia, and about 200 years later in India, where the oldest number known zero was the decimal point, which created the integer that we have today, the decimal system that allows us to go up to count to nine and then 10 and then 11, 12, 13, 14. Prior to that, there were, uh, we have a, uh, I have an evolution of the number zero where the, the Chinese, the, uh, the Mayan Empire, the Babylonian, the uh, Sumatran civilizations and the, the, the uh, 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 different, um, different civilizations, the Egyptians and so on, they have, their own version of number zero, which, which up until about the decimal system, was, it simply meant nothing. There's a difference between nothing and zero. When you have nothing, well, you, know, you either have money, you have no money. But when you have zero, it allows you to have something beyond number nine. Right? So the oldest number zero is number five, zero six, uh, which is in the old calendar, uh, in the old Indian uh, calendar, it's, it's, it's equivalent to the, the year 573 AD, which is the, uh, and that's currently uh, recognized by the Smithsonian and also uh, preserved in the National Museum in Cambodia. 
So you say, why, what does that, why is number zero so such a big deal? Well, it's not such a big deal. But what it does show is that it shows that Cambodians, as well as other genocide survivors, when they come to America, they also bring something with them also. They bring a, a, a history that is rich, a, a number zero, without the number zero, your calculator will be worthless. <laughs> you will not be able to use calculators, you will not be able to add numbers, you will not be able to weigh, you will not be able to do a lot of the uh, science and technologies and engineering and mathematics and uh, that we have today. Uh, there's no internet, no smartphone without number zero. So that's, so these are the type of things that we like to bring out to the American public so that they know that there's more to the genocide survivorship. Uh, there's more to the Khmer people, there's more to the uh, Cambodian people, and there's more to the Hmong people, there's more to the Laotians, the Vietnamese, and Mur the Burmese, the Khmer, because they all, we all have value because that's how we came because it's because of the breakup that you have 12, 13 different countries in Southeast Asia today. Because before then, people just sort of lived together. And if you look here, you, what you'll see is, you see a consistent image of people coming together, really. And uh, the Hubbard family, who owns uh, Channel 5 and 45, uh, when my wife did her uh, did her fundraising and we received thirty thousand dollars from St. Jude. Uh, Hubbard Broadcasting was the uh, was uh, was kind enough to match that for us. Uh, so when they matched that, and then we were able to uh, receive another twenty-five thousand dollars from as part of a veteran project in the Minnesota, the uh, the Minnesota Department of Health and Human Services. That so we got twenty-five thousand dollars. So add them together, we had close to about eighty thousand dollars, ninety thousand dollars. Um, that allowed me to kind of take this <coughs> abstract idea of creating individual values for people to fit into what you see here today. Okay, so I hope that this museum was born in 2016, uh, uh, on the summer of 2015, and the idea is really to take a static, uh, or take static parts of the Khmer history and bring it back to life, like the number zero, like the, uh, the, the concept of heaven on earth. And then what it shows is that when, as human beings, we always have ambition to build something great, but when we don't come together, we kind of have it in that room. That room over there, when you came here three years ago, you would see what's in that room out here. And when you see in here, out here, you would see in that small room. But we decided to reverse that, that presentation, because in that room, is what we call hell on earth. So it's a people that was founded on the idea of building a heaven on earth. And because we don't get along, because we because when we look at you see, oh you're Vietnamese, you're no good, you're Cambodian, you're no good, you're Indonesian, you know when we look at our differences and we look at that as a reason to not come together, <clears throat> then we get what's we look at Cambodian, because if you're white Cambodian, you're black Cambodian, you're pink Cambodian, you, then you start to peel off, and then you start to peel off each other, then you have what's called a caliber. Yes? Yes, I have a question, yes. because our time is limited, yes. and we want to know uh, how we, just we're here, so take advantage of us, because yes. um, uh, some of us we might have uh, connections or interest in, in helping you do what you can, and I love this place, so thank you so much. I think cultural arts and cultural preservation, that's been always very, very important to me. And I love what you're teaching me. But I want to know, as an organization, what are your short-term goals, and how would you like you know, um, us to help you? What do you see for this, um, this wonderful center? Yes, um, really, um, when we do surveys at large groups, mm -hmm. when there's a large group like that, Scott Foundation, we have maybe, 100,000 people come through. Mm -hmm. Almost no one knows where Cambodia is, mm -hmm. or what the Khmer people is, or what's the difference between Cambodian and Campuchian. And some people say, oh, that's, that, that's your problem to solve. You, sometimes you say it was Khmer people, sometimes you say Cambodian, sometimes you say Campuchian. So if, to summarize, nobody knows this 
group of people. And so if, we, uh, if, if, if you can maybe, through your relationships, maybe try to include, if you can include us in some way. And, that, and this museum, at the end of the day, it's not about the Khmer people or the Cambodian people as much as it's about humanity. Using the Khmer people as an example. Okay, we could, we could as well have a Roman museum and have the same storyline. But this is told, the story is told from the perspective of a Cambodian American of why we should accept differences, right? Um, so if you could in some ways include us in whatever programming or uh, uh, opportunities, uh, that would be great. And one thing that gets me most excited, and I, I, I and since we see a, a um, Thea loves to work with all types of community. It gets me excited when someone that is not Khmer shows an interest about Khmer or of the Khmer people. But that means that it, it's not, that means that the genocide failed, right? Because when, gen, when, when genocide succeeds, no one knows about that group of people. When a genocide fails, other people know about that people. So, yeah, so that's what my kind of elongated response in some ways. So if you say that you will be moving to different ways, yeah. why yes. why do you want to move to a different place? Oh, uh, we are a, uh, we're sort of a mobile museum. So we will always have our, our location, but if we wait for, and, and, and I work with the Hmong archives, the Hmong uh, history center, and. Uh, and the Hmong archives, for example, have been around for 20 years. The, the typical year, you'd be lucky to have 500 people to come and, and research about the Hmong people. The same thing for us here. If, if we were to rely on passerby, to uh, strangers to walk up the steps, to, to want to learn about Cambodian and the Khmer people, it, we might get about 200 people per year. Mm -hmm. But if we function as a mobile, platform where we go to large venues, then we can expose the same story to hundreds of thousands per year. So uh, we'll always have our home office, but it's not uh, from from our five year experience of being here, we know that there's not, there won't be a lot of people that will walk up those steps. However, what we, what we have learned is that um, we can reach a million people in four days through YouTube and Facebook. A million people have watched our videos about the museum in four days, whereas in a typical year, we'd be lucky to have 200 real life human beings. So we're, we're, we're integrating technology. Uh, we're, we're using technology to promote history. And I have a question about funding. Yes. Have you received money for funding from the history center, from Ministry of Arts Board, and other public entities? Yes, um, up until this point, our, our, our biggest struggle is that this place is not ADA compliant, number one. Yeah, and, 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 and number two, as an organization, it's very difficult because uh, maybe 30 years ago, they were a lot more accessible funding. Now it's more matching. Okay, so we have to show that we can earn revenue first before there can be uh, funding to, to supplement or to double or to, to match, for example. So uh, the Minnesota, Minnesota Historical Society, I, I, I recently met with, with their, their, their new CEO, and there's been some renewed effort to kind of help us out and work with us, and uh, they, uh, they've been here a couple of times. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, the, the Minnesota Arts Board, I've been on their panel for the uh, for, for grant uh, selection. Mm -hmm. uh, we, up until now, we haven't been in a position uh, financially to, to, to show a grant uh, a, a, a panel of, of grant reviewers to show them that, hey, we are a strong organization uh, that matches our, st our strong ambition, our vision of what we want to do. But we, we have to go through, uh, through that route, and I'm hoping that with Thea's help and that we can maybe uh, pursue more. Yeah, and we also want, uh, as you know, Cambodian population are more down south, Shakopee, Savage, Burnsville, Lakeville. A lot of folks, uh, we want to get uh, our community back into our center mm -hmm. and, and then learn again because we kind of got our memory erased from what mm -hmm. happened. Learn again and be able to become 
oneself as a Khmer people or Cambodian people need to go out. So we are partnered with uh, another organization, an, an adult, a Southeast Asian adult daycare that's going to be in Shakopee area. They bought a new building and we were going to be housed with them mm -hmm. and then also would provide uh, services for our Khmer veterans mm -hmm. to be there, not such a long ride mm -hmm. to come in. And then if they do were to come here, mm -hmm. then they're not able to climb these stairs. Mm -hmm. So strategically, I mean, this is a good location because of the St. Paul, everybody know where everybody's at, the school system, but we were not able to survive because we couldn't find anything that we could afford in this area. So we're working out, so we're gonna do a lot of community events. When we're at the Space Center, it's uh, it's on 169. Um, I hope it didn't go through, but our, the closing for that building is the end of this uh, month. Yes. Or this week, this week yeah. the end of this month. So they're gonna, they're gonna do their activity at, during the day, and we're gonna do our activity in the evening and the weekend. So we're, we're allowed to have you know, activities like this to come and learn about the museum, and then uh, you know anybody will come over. So we, we're hoping that that will kind of sustain us for until we fundraise for our own building, to have our own museum. Our hope is to be like the, remember the Russian uh, museum yeah. on uh, 35? Yeah. We want to have our own building, and we want to make uh, our building the little uh, Uncle what? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what our hope is. So we'll build it, and then um, you know, you all have, you know that there is a Buddhist uh, Buddhist temple in the middle of the cornfield yep. in Farmington. Yep. We're not cornfield, but I don't know what else it means. But when you walk, when you go, if you've never been there, you drive and you see all green, and then whoa, big building with all the gold yep. and everything. Yep. You're like, oh, it's yeah. heaven, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's heaven. Yeah. So yeah. heaven on earth. Yeah. So basically, uh, that building is pretty much like during it's a lot of focus around uh, religion, Buddhas, yeah. and a lot of people felt like it's it's not a community community center. Mm -hmm. So I care and museum want to create another place where, yeah, we go there four times a year. We want to create a place where people can go there monthly or weekly to to become uh, more acclimated with back their own culture. I just learned back the Khmer history or the Cambodian history just this year alone. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been very preoccupied with, you know, earning my daily money, whatever it may be. But I felt like when I start seeing my daughter that knows nothing, ask me all these hard questions like John is asking, I'm like, I have no idea. I just listened to a podcast, I'm like, wow, I didn't realize Cambodian has such a rich history. We're the first, see that bow and arrow there? Original. Uh, Cambodian used it as their weapon of war, you know? So a lot of these items, if you if you guys uh, want, if you have time, because I will gladly walk you around here and learn more about uh, what we have here. But it's really unique. It's one of a kind where uh, in the nation that our facility is outside of Cambodia. I, in, uh, I believe I was in Cambodia about two months ago. They have different pots, places that, that you would, uh, oh, you learn it over here, or you learn over here with Uncle What, you learn a different, it's not a whole history center where people have a full understanding what 30 or uh, 2,000 years ago where Cambodia is at, but I didn't realize the strong, the strong history that we have, you know. So a lot, and then you guys, and then you guys are like beyond us, we're Cambodian, we look like Cambodian, we know nothing of what we came from. So, <laughs> so that's what, that's what encouraged me is to, to learn it and then pass it on. And then we, like I told, and now I told all of my Indian and my uh, Pakistani and friends, I'm like, you know we were related? <laughs> we were born from that? And they're like, what? Yeah, I was like, you're the other side of my, you know, my, my luck. So, yeah. So thank you for, for being here. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah. Yes, yes. A quick question yes. uh, to end the program. Uh, do you have outreach to the schools? We ask that. Yeah. Yes, we, 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 have, uh, we have outreach, but we sort of, uh, we're reluctant to have the children come up the steps. Oh, okay. Again, it goes, it goes back to the, it goes back to the, um, yeah. 
This is, uh, as humble as what we have here, this is the only facility of its kind outside of Cambodia. Okay, it's outside of Cambodia. Uh, there's, there's a genocide memorial center in Chicago, but focusing on genocide again. This is the only place of its kind, and we, uh, I've been suggested to reach out to the schools, and that's definitely where we want it to be. Uh, and we would love to have maybe even a Southeast Asian, uh, maybe a bit of an education, maybe a chapter, a history about how these Southeast Asians got here. Because I, I, I went to high school, and I was not, and even throughout my college years, I was not taught what I learned from this young man here uh, five years ago. Maybe we can start with a teacher in social studies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this, yes. this is yes. a good connection with yeah. Rose, for yeah. sure. Yeah, so, yeah. She's yeah. Not yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's not retired, so. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> oh, I'm from it. Oh, she, can, she can be Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 Well, surely there are, there are materials that you can prepare to take to the school. Yes. Right. Yeah. In, in that room, we, we received over 200 books donated that are now on Amazon.com. Wow. And, and wow. We're getting, uh, and, and here, uh, uh, we were at the state fair, and uh, a gentleman came up, and I, I think someone had mentioned that, they mentioned like 1973 or 1960s. Oh, he said, you know, so I was, I was in the U.S. Uh, Air Force based in Thailand, and I was uh, uh, as part of the uh, the uh, uh, video reconnaissance team. Mm -hmm. I took some photos in Cambodia, and I donated that to the museum. I said, "Oh yes!" Mm -hmm. So we're getting evidences being donated to us again. Yeah. More, and you know, he's a white man, but he cared, so he said, "I care." <laughs> so, so, he, so, so he, this is the type of stuff where you would not be able to find from a Cambodian American or a Cambodian in Cambodia because this part of history, this is was taken by a C, by CIA uh, uh, aero, uh, aircraft that that showed the Angkor Wat from over there uh, uh, from the sky. Um, they were not allowed, they were not supposed to do it, but they did it anyways, but we have it here. So these are the type of uh, textbooks and, and, and documents that we that we try to, to put here. Thank you. All right, thank you, and you're welcome to stay after you want to